There was a phrase in there that I was curious to ask you a little bit about. Um, acceptance literally means taking what's offered, whether it's uncomfortable or not. Could you explore that one a little bit more for me? The, the analogy I, I like to use um, is around if you I imagine you're on a car journey and you come to a red traffic light. If you're if you're not in a, a, a massive rush, which you know sometimes we, we will be, but generally you're, you're driving along and you come to like you, you tend to come to a stop okay it's slightly annoying because nobody really wants a red light but you don't you don't often kick up a big fuss about the red light you have accepted that it's a part of driving um, and it will happen on your journey um, and it's you know a very similar concept it, the, the the moment that we can accept that difficult thoughts and feelings will crop up as part of our sporting experience as part of our life more generally we then can sit patiently and wait for the light to go green, wait for the next feeling or thought to come along. And actually, it doesn't impact us quite as much as if you imagine you're on a car journey and you are in a massive rush and that red light is now a, a huge inconvenience. And you cannot accept that. You know, you think it's so unfair and um, a very different experience, isn't it? Internally, how frustrating that car journey is. Probably don't get there any quicker, but it's incredibly frustrating versus the acceptance piece so I, I sort of compare that to life if we can go through life accepting things feelings and thoughts that crop up I think our internal experience and therefore our outer experience is, is very different it doesn't mean to say you have to like it so we're not saying oh you have to sort of grit your teeth and go okay that's fine you kind of just have to go okay I can make space for it okay it's here which is again is a very different approach Well, welcome, Alison and Jenna. Thank you for joining me today. Um, we're a bit book crazy on the podcast at the moment. Numerous books are getting put out, and uh, and I'm loving the the topic that you've chosen. I want to give it that profile because I th I'd love the podcast to to be able to support people who've synthesised their thoughts, their practice, and their ideas. And so we are going to be. I'd love to talk about your new book, uh, Drop the Struggle. Um, before we do that, could, would you be kind enough to, to give people on an overview of your background? Um, Alison, could I ask you to go first? Uh, yes, you can. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a mishmush, as you say, mongrel, but that's not very polite, is that? I'm a bit of a mishmush of things. Um, I actually spent the beginning of my career um, as an HR director, so come out of the world of business, but to kind of saw the error of my ways um, when I turned 40 and went, mm, sh should have been a PE teacher. Actually, I would have been a terrible PE teacher if, um, if that had happened. Um, but went back to university, got a master's degree, did a PhD, did some really interesting research in the area of performance psychology, but also in the area of people's access to a healthy ways of doing sport and then found my way into a, a business that I, I came across Jenna and we worked together called Lane 4 where it was a, an amalgam of sport and psychology and business um, and then that's kind of how I get to where I am now I, I now run my own business partly with Jenna partly with somebody else um, using what I know from sports psychology to help people lead you know unapologetic and, and more healthy uh, lives wonderful um a healthy a healthy view of sports and performance so we'll get into that i'm sure um jenna yeah sure hello um so i'm jenna i uh, i suppose my background was in in sport itself so i played hockey um lucky enough to to you know uh, represent england um at sort of junior international level um, went and played abroad over in Germany and Australia, travelled loads of hockey, had some amazing experiences. And I was always really fascinated by the psychology side of it. You know, what, what was talent? Why, why did some people who were really talented go on to make it and others didn't? And sort of the same with team performance. Why was it that some teams went on to, to win even if they didn't have the best players as such? So um, 
I studied psychology um, and then went into sports psychology, um, sort of combining my two passions, if you like, of sport and psychology. I thought, God, is this really a career? My two favourite things. Um, and then uh, it's, it's it's difficult to get into sports psychology. And for those listening who are sort of just starting out, it's it, it's challenging. And um, you know, there's lots of different routes in. Um, I, as Alison said, I started working for this company called Lane Four um and learned absolutely loads there um about i suppose my craft uh, my philosophy and um now work independently as a sports psychologist in um in sport in business in education as well taking some of those great lessons that we know from sport into into other domains of life so an international hockey player jenna um but on page five of the book inverted commas i never quite made it discuss <laughs> you've gone straight straight in with the with the difficult well, uh, well, uh, yeah i suppose there's a there's a, an element of psychological wrangling going on there but i'm curious about this i've been spoken yeah. to olympic silver medalists and they're like oh i didn't get quite i wasn't good enough it's like oh really um so yeah come on give me your thoughts yeah it is an interesting wasn't isn't it and i grew up in a household whereby i've got three siblings and they all represented uh, England at some sport, all in different sports. So I suppose the bar was always set quite high for me. Um, Olympics was always sort of the the, the dream, if you like. Um, and yeah, I got to sort of the age of twenty one, and it's it's a big jump from junior to to the senior setup um, in in any sport, but in hockey. Um, and it was at that point it's sort of right. Do I want to dedicate my whole life to it? Um, and you know, would I be good enough? And there's all sorts of reasons why um, why I didn't make that jump. But at the end, I didn't go to an Olympics. Um, I have had some experiences that I'm incredibly grateful for for hockey. And a lot of my, you know, my bestest friends now are, are from that time. So I'm so thankful for that and for, you know, the experiences that I had. But in the sort of definition of of high performance sport, I didn't make it to an Olympics, so that I suppose stays in the background somewhere. I might return to that one. Um, it's fascinating that sort of bar setting, you know, setting the standards, setting the goal, and always looking at that. I remember Christian Swan on the podcast talking about those trouble with goals is that you're always behind it. Um, mm. So I'll be fascinated to hear your thoughts on that a bit mm. further as we go through. So look. I want to get straight into the book because drop the struggle. Um, I saw it on um, various social media um, and websites and so on. And I thought, gosh, that's a compelling title. Um, and I love a lot of the phrasing that you've used, drop the struggle, accept being uncomfortable, play in the now, do what matters. So it's, it's, it's immediately really um, accessible why why did you call it drop the struggle specifically um so I, I, it's always hard to name a book isn't it to summarize what a book is about in in a title is difficult i think one of the key concepts in the book is this idea that you can't control your thoughts actually and and it's funny coming from psychologists because isn't our job to help people kind of manage and control their thoughts but actually we take a very different approach in recognizing that our minds are these wonderful machines that go in all sorts of different directions and and actually you know positive thinking positive um encouragement visualization it, it does work sometimes and it can take you so far but but we recognized in our practice Alison and I that it's not bomb proof it doesn't always work it sometimes works for some people but actually we wanted to use an approach that once once you get to grips with it it can work all the time anytime for whoever and we really believe this this approach acceptance and commitment therapy that we talk through in the book does and I suppose for us dropping the struggle with your thoughts is at the heart of that so actually if we don't try and control them if we let go of that struggle of you know almost imagine the sort of tug of war of, of trying to control our thoughts if we drop that then there's a whole new world of possibility out there that is waiting for us so it's not so much a, uh, a book about uh, avoiding or not utilizing positive thinking 
um, it's it's understanding where you're at and starting to to think about what you can do about it. Would that be my would that be a fair understanding of of what you're trying to address? I I'd say it it's as Jenna said that there's a fundamental principle in the book and which is underpinned by acceptance and commitment therapy, which is um, it doesn't matter whether you think positively or negatively, it, it's almost irrelevant. It's the fact that you're not struggling with those thoughts or those feelings, that you make space for them, that you don't turn away from them. You don't need to worry whether they're positive or negative. In fact, you'll notice in the book, we, we purposefully avoid using the word negative or positive in there. It is better to ask the question, Does is this helping you in the, in the long term? And if it's not, would you like to do it in a different way and to drop the struggle? So yeah, it's quite a fundamental shift to the way that that we have been brought up as sports psychologists and the way that you know many people in sports psychology do operate. And did you have a specific goal when you were putting your thoughts down on paper for uh, developing this as a manuscript and you're starting to work together? Did you have a specific goal in mind? It's a good question. Um, I think Alison and I have both found this approach so helpful for ourselves in life in you know it's probably a bit too late that we found it in sport but in in our lives and the, from the clients that we work with we recognize how amazingly valuable it can be for them so I suppose our goal was to just spread that more widely like imagine if everybody could drop the struggle how different society would be um you know what, what, what about sport performance imagine Olympic games where everybody um you know wasn't grappling with with difficult thoughts and um and actually you know it could be so i suppose to to spread the to spread the word to get to get acceptance of commitment therapy out there and to make it a bit more accessible for sports people so it's used a lot in in clinical settings um and actually we know that sports people are quite we talked a little bit about goals already quite goal orientated quite practical quite tangible people so we wanted to bring that side of this um approach to it as well and I think it was about putting pen to paper over something where I think we both felt that previously with clients, there were many cases where we'd, we'd almost like stuck a sticking plaster on as a solution. It was a short term fix for them. It might have got them over the next competition, but it wasn't a long term solution to help them to be effective and to perform really well. And again, to come back to that notion of, of healthy, have a healthy way of, of performing in their sport. And so it was also a way of getting that out there for people. Does that differ at all from the sort of flow states versus the clutch states of flow feeling super easy and it's almost um, you're in the moment and 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 there's an ease to performance versus clutch states, which are, I believe, are a little bit more concerted. You might be struggling. It might be a bit more intense to sort of eke the performance out. Um, is is that is there any similarities there between the two different frameworks? I think there's a similarity and a difference. Um, so there's some similarity in the sense of in flow state, you know, you are very present, and certainly within ACT and, and the work that we do now, being um, playing in the moment. You know, one of the processes that we go through, being very present, is absolutely something that helps performance. And though. It, it doesn't actually matter whether you're in flow state or not from our point of view. Mm, okay. Yeah, so you you could be incredibly nervous and still, you know, with, with this sort of approach and still put, can't go out there and perform at your absolute best. Um, you know, you still might actually wake up that day not feeling very confident, but with this approach, still go out and perform at your best. Whereas I suppose with flow... I mean, it's, it's the it's the goal, right? It's the aim is great if we can get to that point where actually you don't have negative thoughts interrupting, um, where you're able to just be totally present and, and mentally and physically be be in that state. But I think that yeah, like Alison said, the other side to it is it's okay if you're not, mm -hmm. and we don't have to struggle against that. Yeah, and I, I know I work quite a lot in rowing, and quite often a boat can come down the course, and the athlete will get to the end and go, that felt really uncomfortable. Uh, my thoughts my feelings just how the boat felt everything and yet they've just done the best performance of their life so it's about recognizing that that 
striving to get rid of the negative feelings and negative thoughts is not the end ga game. The end game is to actually do what matters, to step forward. Even though your mind may be feeling great stuff, it may be not feeling great stuff, that you actually go out there and, and do what you need to do in the moment. Okay. It's a great question. And um, you've, we've mentioned ACT, Acceptance Commitment Therapy, a couple of times now already, but uh, for those who are not familiar with the framework, um, that you base the book on. Could you just expand upon it? Shall I do that, Jenna? Go on, Alison. <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, as Jenna said, um, it is a frame that, that's come from a clinical setting, very well evidenced. Uh, I forget how, now how many papers there are in the clinical setting supporting the impact of ACT on well-being and, and you, you can call that in a clinical setting on performance too. Um, and and what, what it is, it's the next level on. So if people have come around across CBT, which quite often in sport, CBT is becoming more and more accepted. You'll, we certainly come across athletes who say, yes, I've, I've worked with a sports psychologist in terms of CBT. It's the next level on type of behavioral therapy. And whereas CBT says, uh, do you know what, if you have those thoughts and feelings, you know, if you're, if you're feeling quite anxious, let's do some work to dial down your anxiety level. Or if you have a thought that's negative, let's find a way to reframe that and, and do that. And sometimes that's quite helpful. So Jenna and I are not saying it's not helpful to do that. But what ACT does, it takes it the next level further. And it says, uh, do you know what, it doesn't actually matter the goal is not to control them the goal is to take the committed action towards something so you can enact you can make space for those thoughts and feelings you can as we've said drop the struggle with them and then decide in the moment to take the action towards the thing that's really important to you so it's almost like turning cbt again a little bit on its head so we would never work with trying to someone might feel anxious they might not feel anxious they might feel positive they might not feel positive might feel negative might not feel negative it doesn't actually matter it's about not using all the energy up to to go with that do you want to add anything jenna on that um no i think you've explained that very well the act acronym seems quite pertinent in this in this regard the the very ne the necessity of then saying that's where i'm at and this is what i'm going to do yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. And I think that's that's why we recognise you can't control thoughts, but you can absolutely control your behaviours and your actions. And so if you as a as a sports person can um, can sort of take yourself back to what good looks like, you know, when I'm confident, when I'm feeling at my best, this is what I might be doing. I might my shoulders might be back, my chin might be up, I might be chatting to my teammates or then regardless of how you're feeling the focus is on going and doing those behaviors and those actions and if if the positive feelings come great if they don't then that's okay too um so absolutely that that sort of commit commitment to acting in a way that's positive that's helpful for you um and i suppose the other word acceptance is also really important for for act so recognizing that as sports people we put ourselves in positions that are uncomfortable we have to compete against other people we have to put ourselves into a vulnerable position where we might or might not get selected um and actually it's amazing the number of people who get there and then freak out and actually if we can just accept that there's all sorts of uncomfortable feelings that will come with that it's just a very different picture we're looking at I was reading through the book and, and thinking about that Viktor Frankl quote of between a stimulus and a response is a choice. And, and that, that very nature of you get to play the game that, that you want to. And, and I think I was struck when I first started working with elite performers. I, I was sort of quite baffled that, about how concerned they were how worried they were i was expecting this sort of champion mindset of if you if you know if you believe it you can achieve it and it was all very optimistic and gung-ho and i'm gonna do it but i spent a lot of time thinking gosh they're quite worried <laughs> they're, they're quite they're quite nervous they're quite afraid oh but they're going to do something about it and that being a real noticeable difference of rather than it, it feeling like it choked people or that it, it it limited people, 
it, it almost felt like it was the information that they needed to develop a plan of action. Yeah. You know, one of the things Jen and I might do right at the beginning of meeting somebody is we use something called the miracle question, which is not specific to act, but it's going, if I had a magic wand and it, with my magic wand, I could get rid of the thoughts and feelings that are uncomfortable to you and that you don't want to have, what would you be doing? And then once we know that, we can then work with the processes that are in the book to help them go, okay, it's quite normal that you want to run away from feeling nervous. And it's quite normal that you want to, you know, your mind can flip flop backwards and forwards, trying to argue whether you're good or you're not good, or you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. You know, so let's work with all of that so that you can go and do those things that if that wasn't ever going to bother you, that, that you want to do. Yeah, and it's it's interesting, isn't it, Steve, that perception of, um, you know, highly successful people in whatever realm, you know, we were CEOs of, of businesses or Olympic athletes, it doesn't mean that they have an absence of fear, worry, anxiety, whatever it is, um, it doesn't mean they have abundant confidence, but it's very easy to look at other people and think that they do. So, you know, again, you know, hopefully part of this book is recognising that everybody, no matter where you are, who you are, everybody has those kinds of difficult thoughts it's just how you how you deal with them how you manage them yeah i noticed you give uh, a bit of attention early in the book to the, the the normality of these feelings and and you present it as a survival mechanism that we haven't necessarily evolved beyond those nerves comparison the competition the melee of brain activity that that you you experience those are normal things that have helped our the origin of our species and and so we should sort of expect them to be around exactly yeah that's yeah. Beautifully and, good. yeah and as soon as you do it's then you know just it's sort of almost like a just a bit of a weight off it's like oh okay so so i don't have to try and get rid of them no actually we can we can work with them and we can still be great and happy and successful whatever that is with them um so yeah and there's a there's a lovely phrase that um that you have uh i've written some notes page 42 the thoughts we have are nothing more than words and pictures now that was i found that quite um uplifting in some ways but in but from a very objective point of view as in it it, it sort of descending it right down to um, the product of our brain activity as opposed to something that seems to sort of connect to our identity or something that represents how good we are. Um, and I often think about this, I mean, I'm a physiologist by trade, as you, as you might know, but I often think about this, what's the difference between a, a strange negative thought and an itch? An itch originates perhaps on the periphery but it, it is felt in the brain i don't know whether there's much difference between that or a thought about whether i'm good enough or not mm, i think they're very similar in fact that's a great analogy i might borrow that Steve. Have, thank you have that have that is that thank that's going to turn up in the next next yeah. discussion next yeah, book. Good. It yeah, is. Good. yeah no but it, it is and um, you know we talk about the fact that thoughts no matter how difficult they are are fleeting they do pass and we use a sort of analogy of the weather in the sky um and it's the same with an itch if you sit with an itch long enough it goes away <laughs> um it's incredibly tempting to to scratch it but um you know it's the same with thoughts if we sit with them they will they will pass and another thought will come in its place um we uh, we use the analogy of um if you have a little stone in the bottom of your sock you know how irritating it is when you're walking along and you can sort of keep stopping and you know keep trying to um you know remove the sock remove the stone and then sort of another one another one comes in its place or actually you can sort of just okay there's a there's a little bit of an uncomfortableness in my in my foot and actually it sort of definitely changes the way that you that you walk and that you think about it or feel about it um so yeah it's an interesting one what actually are thoughts <laughs> And I, I love what you say, though, about it sometimes feeling like also it's our identity. So th there's an exercise in the book called I am, I am um, not. And that's that's when we get so attached to the fact that 
like if you say I'm afraid feels like no one can see me on, the, on this I know but I'm touching myself like it's me it's who I am I am I am the afraidness of you know that's who I am and actually you know a simple exercise is to go oh I'm feeling afraid so I'm having the feeling that I'm afraid and then to go oh I'm noticing that I'm having the feeling that I'm afraid afraid and that separation as Jenna said like being the sky suddenly and being able to notice oh it's just a feeling it's that electrical impulse that's in my body sure it's in my body I can feel it and it's passing too it's not who I am I'm me having a feeling that I'm feeling afraid at the moment and it'll pass at some point so yeah it's very easy for athletes to get really fused with the notion of it's who I am as well so this seems to uh, um, give precedence to this idea of mindfulness and having this sort of out of body meta experience of being able to see those emotions or thoughts for what they are. That, as you discuss it, I think it was the thinking and observing parts of your brain, the sky or the weather, which I thought was a lovely layering to to that that thought process. Um, in terms of the, the thoughts that might arise about whether they're critical about yourself or whether you you don't think you're good enough in the moment, um, is this applicable to overcoming an unpleasant experience? So you've experienced something, it's happened in the past, it has made you feel in a certain way, and you're still trying to process it months or years down the line. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I don't think there's a there's a timeline on it. Um, I think the skills and tools and metaphors that we use um, can be helpful for, for all different types of situations. I'd say um, that what, what we do talk about in the book is practice them away from the sport, let's say the sports arena, practice them away from the, the cup final or the, the you know, the championship race. Um, and explore them you know day to day and then when you go into those situations you're more prepared you're more able to use them but similarly if something's happened in the past you know use the tools to to explore that and to to move on from it I suppose absolutely and why don't you think we do this naturally why don't we do this enough I mean I'm I'm sort of sensing that we're we're all defaulting to trying to make ourselves busy people um, perhaps rather than living a slightly healthier life or or even being a bit kinder to ourselves. I think you've touched on one of the reasons, which is, that, you know, biologically that that's how we operate still, rightly or wrongly, through our evolution. So there's always that instinctual response of a thought comes up, a feeling comes up. It's the protective mechanism I, I think it's partly because we've been think what we've been taught as children, you know, don't cry, don't say that, think positive, you can do it, you know, all of those things, particularly in sport, the mantras that are kind of laid out, we're taught to go down that route of not having feelings and to thinking that we have to be positive. So it's really kind of no surprise that this is where we've got to. And, and Jenna and I know in the work that we do, once someone we kind of, it's almost like the, the, Shields come off the eyes, kind of like they've taken their glasses off and can suddenly see um, that somebody goes, oh, I could be like that. It's OK. I, I had an athlete not long ago who suddenly went, I could just let that feeling rumble through. And it was, it was like I'd said something miraculous and I hadn't. And for her, though, it was like a huge revelation that actually she could just let those feelings be there. And she realized they didn't overwhelm her. They were just feelings and they did come and they did go and they weren't there all the time and they weren't all who she was. So, yeah, I, I think we're conditioned, Steve, to, you know, through the biology then to go, oh, well, we have to carry on doing this. Mm. Yeah, it strikes me as a missed opportunity, either as teachers or managers, to be encouraging that thought process for people to, to at least be vulnerable enough to share their thoughts or concerns. Um, to vocalise them to other people, but to have the sense to encourage other people to be with those thoughts, recognise them for what they are, and then perhaps move them to action. 
yeah definitely and I think um you know you've got social media which does sort of the opposite and, and it's great in lots of ways but it also mostly only promotes positivity um and so that you've got someone sitting there with uncomfortable feelings looking at the world around them and how they should be x y and z and it, it it can make it more difficult so i think we're we're going in a good direction in that people are talking about it more um you know people are more comfortable now sharing things and i suppose the next step is then giving more people more tools to help with it which hopefully this book does although when we launched the book we had a question from a member of the audience who said to us oh is this only for people who are you know who um Oh, what's the right word not struggling but you know not performing well and we kind of went no it's not actually this is about healthy performing for for anybody so I think also and we find it as sports psychologists that quite often a coach won't won't direct an athlete to us until they're really kind of hit rock bottom they're really struggling and we go oh what if we could teach you some of this stuff in the normal course of events but unfortunately, often coaches don't leave the space for us to work in that way, to build those healthy skills so that when an athlete does get to a difficult point, they've not been selected or, you know, they've missed a penalty or, you know, they haven't been selected for the Olympics or, they, you know, they come get a silver medal and not a gold when they were expected, whatever it is. But then they've got the set of skills in their tool bag to be able to work with it in a healthy, you know, healthy way going forwards. Um, but that unfortunately isn't, it certainly isn't my experience. Jenna, I don't know if it's your experience. No, it's not. I mean, sports psychology is it's becoming, um, you know, most of the top teams in the sport pe people have one now. But, um, yeah, we'd, lo we'd love to get it for more people earlier on um, and, and have it more accessible. So it's not just something that only elite performers can, can have access to. So, so in that sense... Um that question that you raised earlier just that sense of well is this thought helping me move forward perhaps if it is a critical thought or a negative thought then no and therefore what you're going to do about it but if it equally is a positive and facilitative thought that it might be what am I going to do with this or how can I get more of this so that it's a it's a facility it's it's helping them move forward more um, commonly Yes, we often use the phrase, don't argue backwards and forwards in your head. Is it is it true or not? Don't need to prove that it's true or it's not true. That's wasted energy and wasted thought and gets you just caught up in the struggle again. But actually go, is it helpful? If it's helpful, carry on, use it. And if it's not helpful, let's use one of these processes to help you unhook from it, to drop the struggle from it, to make space for the feelings, to stay in the moment and to get on. And Yeah, what do you now need to go and do? Because also you can have a, a, let's say, negative thought that is helpful and you can have a positive thought that's unhelpful, right? So you might, if you're a 100 metre sprinter, you might be stood on the start line thinking, um, I don't know, off the top of my head, oh, I am so slow. I need to get faster. I'm so slow. And if that thought drives you through that race and helps you to win, great. Who are we to say that it's it's negative? You know, and equally, you might have a thought, which is this is fine. I've got this under control. I'm absolutely fine. I've, I'm really great. I'm going to win this race. And actually, that doesn't give you the little extra oomph that you need. So, yeah, we focus more on helpful and unhelpful rather than positive and negative. Hmm. There's a phrase in there that I was curious to ask you a little bit about. Um, acceptance literally means taking what's offered, whether it's uncomfortable or not. Could you explore that one a little bit more for me? The, the analogy I, I like to use um, is around if you I imagine you're on a car journey and you come to a red traffic light. If you're if you're not in a, a, a massive rush, which you know sometimes we, we will be, but generally you're, you're driving along and you come to right, you, you, you tend to come to a stop. OK, it's slightly annoying because nobody really wants a red light, but you don't you don't often kick up a big fuss about the red light. You have accepted that it's a part of driving um, and it will happen on your journey. Um, and it's, you know, a very similar concept. It, the, the, the moment that we can accept that difficult thoughts and feelings will crop up as part of our sporting experience, as part of our life more generally, we then can sit patiently and wait for the light to go green, wait for the next feeling or thought to come along. And actually it doesn't, 
impact us quite as much as if you imagine you're on a car journey and you are in a massive rush and that red light is now a, a huge inconvenience and you cannot accept that you know you think it's so unfair and you, um a very different experience isn't it internally how frustrating that car journey is probably don't get there any quicker but it's incredibly frustrating versus the acceptance piece so i i sort of compare that to life if we can go through life accepting things feelings and thoughts that crop up i think our internal experience and therefore our outer experience is, is very different it doesn't mean to say you have to like it so we're not saying oh you have to sort of grip your teeth and go okay that's fine you kind of just have to go okay i can make space for it okay it's here which is again is a very different approach yeah and and so that phrase in itself i i can make space for this um that feels like it helps people be a little bit uh, more accepting of being uncomfortable because if the very notion or the very phrase of accept being uncomfortable is quite uncomfortable and people will dislike it um mm. as opposed to thinking it's just life um how, how do you commonly help people get over that i always think this is one of the hardest parts of act i don't know what you think jenna i think think because it's there's such a feeling of it that the thinking parts of things people can rationalize and you know but the feeling part because we feel it in our bodies you will know that as a physiologist you know you can you feel it you don't want to have that feeling so i mean one of my favorite ways and we I think we have that exercise in the book is about thinking of yourself like a flexible container like a soft flexible container that you can actually know where that feeling is in your body you know something's in their head something's in their chest me mine's always sort of right on my solar plexus kind of thing sometimes in your stomach you can you can breathe around it you can make space for it you can give it a name you can notice that it's not bigger than you and as soon as you start to and that's usually the turning point for people when you say is it bigger than you you know imagine where, where is it how you know is it moving is it still uh, where's the edge of it kind of thing is it fluid and then go oh no it's kind of here and it's this big and okay can you make space for that could you take that with you and it's about opening up that possibility whereas in the beginning I think it feels for most people like it's whoa it's bigger than me and it's right. all over me and I'm consumed by it and suddenly it's not it's just a part of you that you're taking with you into your performance so I don't know that's one of my favorite ways Jenna do you have a favorite yeah well the, the other one um we use in the book is saying yes to your feelings emotions thoughts um and actually how very different that is compared to saying no and what we mean by saying no is you know as Alison said we're taught from quite young age don't be nervous you know don't don't worry well, if I'm trying to not worry and not be nervous, I'm saying no to it. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, subconsciously sort of push that away. And actually, if we say yes to it and again, make space for it, open up to it, say yes, come in. I've, I've invited you here because I'm stepping into this sport, which I know is going to challenge me. It's a very different experience. Um, so almost just you know, part all of this in the first stage is recognising when those things crop up and then actually just saying yes to it it's very very different to, mm. to what we're used to yeah and quite often i will say to an athlete also you know if you're if you're i don't know you're down the park with your mates kicking the football around you're probably not going to have those feelings but it's because this is a cup match and it's really important to you that you do well that suddenly you're nervous so you know recognize also this is important to you you want to play well you like your team you want to I don't know, whatever your kind of your, your values are and your motivations are. So it's also recognizing that th these uncomfortable feelings don't usually come up when things are, are not important to us. So that, that's usually another interesting thing for, for athletes to think just, about. Just, I mean, just that sense of, of you um, recommending, sort of feeling how big it is or where it is, um, that feels to me like it, it can start to externalize it to a certain degree because I think a lot of people don't want to be uncomfortable they like to be in their comfort zone or the if they stretch beyond it that it it, it feels manageable um, or it's a safe stretch and 
It's, meant, it's interesting you mentioned values, and I'd love to ask you a bit about, about values, but I remember the early stages of, of my career, but also, um, you know, as a, as a practitioner, but also working for myself. I remember those times where I just thought, I am out of my depth. Uh, I, I, I like risk. I like to be out of my comfort zone, but not this far. Um, that sense of, of a degree of uncomfortableness and that sense of this is starting to overwhelm me and now what am I going to do about it? And the first base that I've often re resorted to are values. Um, whether that is just out of desperation when I didn't really know what I was doing um, or actually out of learning and development and skill later on. Um, and it's interesting that you raise the importance of values to be able to recognize um, something that's useful. But you do, you do distinguish what values are and what they're not. I thought that was a very interesting list for, for people to consider. So I've got it in front of me, if I can read a few of those out, I'd love to get your comments on. Um, values are not just about being happy, not just about being right or wrong, not rules to live by, uh, not how people treat us or not feelings, but they are different for everybody. Um, how they can use, how you can use them change over time. Um, either freely chosen, the values provide you with some direction. Um, so I thought it was a really interesting distinction, so that, so that people have a cleaner view as to what values are worth developing. I, I don't know, Alice, if you want to go, but um, yeah, so values are often, it's often a, you know, a starting point um, in, in a conversation. Uh, and we use them as a, we articulate them as a bit of a compass. Um, so very different to goals. When you get a goal, you can sort of reach it and you've done that. You, you never reach a value. You're, you're always striving to live by them. Um, and I think, like you say, Steve, in times of challenge or difficulty or uncomfortableness, just such a useful tool to be able to go back to i've 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 chosen this because i'm living by my value of courage or of progression or you know whatever it is um so i think it's just that useful reminder almost to come back to and again when you're at points in your life where you've got to make decisions do i do this do i not you know am i you can always go back to your values and am i acting in line with with those and if you are it can just give you that reassurance um that you're going in the direction that you want to go in so it just helps you to live a little bit more of a considered life i suppose um with with the values in place and i would say one of the aha moments often for athletes as well is that they think about values about how they how they are towards other people and they forget that their values are about also about how they are towards themselves and again sometimes that's a bit of an aha moment they go oh, I have to trust myself in this situation. <laughs> and then you explore, well, what does that open up? What would you then be doing if you trusted yourself and or whatever their value is, you know? So that, that's another thing, reason why I love values as a, as a compass for action for people rather than goals. Goals, you have to have goals and they have to be values directed goals in terms of, of where you go with, with them. And do you have a suggestion specifically how people choose those or identify the values that are useful uh yeah with, i mean lots of different ways that, that you can do that um and you know there's the sort of um you know act guidance that that you might follow but i suppose in 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 terms of this call just you might think about one 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 i quite like is thinking about your retirement um party from your sport or um you know your 50th birthday or whatever it is and if you sort of fast forward to those think about um a few people stand up and make a speech about you and if you consider what it is that you'd like them to be saying about you and not about necessarily it's about what you've accomplished but about who who you are in that process you know what do you want them to say about who you are as a, as a person as an athlete and that can often be quite a helpful way to think about take sort of the achievement to the, to one side and think about who do I want to be in this world in this sport um, and it can help just to guide your thoughts I suppose around what's important to you 
And that's where we say everybody's different. So there's no right or wrong values, um, but it's about what's important to you. So whatever that looks like. Yeah, and I sometimes think that people um, know they've got the right set of values for who they are when, when they imagine it's a bit like they put a cloak on. Or if you're old, old like me and you remember what sticks of rocks rock alike and you've got, you know, Blackpool written around the middle of it. It's a bit like well, what's written through the middle of you that would describe who, who you are. So it's a kind of a nice way to check. Yeah, I did that exercise. Have I, have I got a set of values that feels like who, who I am and what's important to me in the life I want to lead? Mm, yeah okay uh, i like that um that sense of it without some, wanting to sound like i'm going to break into the greatest showman but this is me you know that sense of of i looking at a set of of words or um principles and thinking is that me and swapping in and out uh, that refinement um, aspect. But I also love the Alfred Noble sort of, you know, I've, I've read my obituary and I want to, and I'm not dead and I'm going to change my life and do something that's actually <laughs> quite, quite generous to society rather than uh, toxic. Um, they might evolve as well, by the way. So, you know, I don't think um, you sort of sit down for yeah. half an hour and decide on your, you know, it's it's something that you explore a little bit. You think, as Alison says, we'll try it on, see how it goes. And then um, things things obviously evolve as, as you consider them more and more. And Russ Harris gives a lovely example of um, thinking of them like um, the countries on a globe. And, you know, you can spin a globe around, but sometimes some values come to the front and some, some are at the back. You know, so in certain situations, you know, these two values or three values might be the ones that you're you're doing your sport by or interacting with people in your team or whatever it is. And then to other times it, it slips around and it's those two. So I like the fact that also, you, you know, you're not doing all of them all at the same time kind of thing. You can work with them in different situations. Hmm. That's nice. I've, I've always sort of tended to go to review values at times of transition, um, a period of when I perhaps need to reorient and, um, and review. Um, you mentioned Russ Harris, um, and this sort of leads me on to the, I think it was the sort of C as part of ACT, so the commitment, the, that, that move to action, the doing part. And I was struck by the way that you framed confidence specifically as an action. Um, the action of confidence comes first, the feelings of confidence comes later. That to me was a, a, a real sort of, ooh, that, feel, that looks and feels different. Um, confidence often boosts me to act rather than, oh, I'll, I'll get there eventually. <laughs> um, help, help me along with that particular concept. Mm -hmm. It was a bit of a game changer for me reading his book called the, it's not written for sport, but it's, it's called The Confidence Gap, which is just, a, a, and when I read that, that statement, oh, I went, oh my goodness, what if, what if athletes could learn that, that actually it's the action of confidence and the feelings will be there or not? And we know that as psychologists, that you're not confident all of the time. And what, I think we say it in the book, you know, what if you spend most of your athletic career? I think I probably did, in fact. That's why I gave up, you know, athletics in my 20s, because I was waiting to be confident. I used to come off a race and go, I could have run faster. Well, do you know what? I, I could have turned that around, going back to our conversation with values, thinking about my values of, of kind of courage and excitement. I could have stepped up to that line and with a wholly different mentality about how I was going to approach a race rather than waiting until I felt like, you know, I was going to get to the end with all my breath. I wouldn't embarrass myself or all of those things that, that went through my head as, as I, you know, as I was a 400 meter runner. So for me, it was a game changer, just having that shift of what would it be like we took action and then let the feelings come later i don't know jenna what, yeah what i mean i think it goes back to doesn't it we can't whether we wake up with confidence or not we can't control and we can try right. and do things to, to find it and to feel confident but actually what if we realize we don't need it and that that it sounds so counterintuitive for an athlete yeah but surely we need confidence but but what if we we actually don't and what if we we went and did what we needed to do regardless of how we were 
feeling that day and we can that's the beauty of it we can and that's in any environment so if you've got an interview if you've got a presentation if you've got you know the the, the penalty flick that's going to win the tournament whatever it is it's about knowing what you need to do to to step out there and act in the way that is going to help your performance regardless of how you're feeling so I think again it can just be that sort of weight lifted of oh, okay that's one less thing I need to try and try and get or try and have it, it seems it seems obvious to a degree but it doesn't seem common practice habitually it seems obvious that you would climb a mountain I'm climbing a mountain today is the day we're climbing and you get on with climbing and then you look back down the mountain and think oh haven't we done well or haven't we progressed well and that provides you with the inspiration or the wherewithal or the feeling that you can take those next steps yeah and i think probably with act we, we'd probably even delve deeper and go let's look at how climbing that mountain has impacted your values how have you used your values to climb that mountain and we'd use that as our kind of rather than the feeling we'd use that as the motivator to what are we going to do next tomorrow where are we going to climb now tomorrow so i think that's again a subtle shift in the traditional way that sports psychology might have said okay do the action take then the feeling apply it to the next action we're saying okay you may still not get the feeling you may get the feeling great you know use it if you can if you haven't got it keep following those values as the compass towards moving moving forwards they're the motivation to do the next climb and the next climb and the next climb and that seems that seems true to this sort of towards the end of the book around embracing setbacks and failures that that you would be reflecting in a different way rather than the outcome it's about the experience but also what it can tell you about your the next steps yeah exactly and you know again there's a lot of, it's sometimes easier said than done but actually with with practice with consideration with reflection with with working through it um, it can be enormously powerful setbacks and how much we can learn and, and take from those. So, yeah, it's just, again, recognizing that there's a great quote somewhere. Um, I think it was Michael Jordan. I'm not, you know, successful um, in spite of my setbacks. I'm successful because of them. And I think he's talking about failures and it's exactly that. It's, um, you know, taking those, using them, embracing them to help you rather than to, to hold you back. Um, you, you mentioned about, changing habits and creating a routine based around um, developing healthy habits on a day-to-day -day basis the three r's i think it was could you could you um, unpack that for me too yeah so um a lot of the habit stuff that we talk about in the book comes from or is inspired by james clear's work and his great book atomic habits um for, for, for those of you that have heard of it um, and I guess this is just really applicable to sport because it's so tangible. It's something that okay, we can I, can, I know how to how to do this. Um, so you know, the, the first thing is to have a reminder to do something. So it's very easy to to forget. Um, and you know, a lot of the work that we do, actually, the first bit is just remembering to do it. So you know, having that reminder, um, doing it as as regularly as often as you can. So again, a lot of the tools and skills that we that we use, actually, the more that you can do it, the better, the more that you can get into that routine. But then also um, giving yourself a little bit of a pat on the back every now and then, which is something that we, we don't tend to be very good at, particularly sports people who are always on to the next thing, on to the next thing. So recognising that, you know, well, I did that this week and I'm, and I'm pleased with that. So having that kind of reward or something that's going to continue to motivate you with that behaviour. Um, can just be a really nice way of thinking about a new habit that you want to start or something that you want to change um, to having the reminder getting into the routine and then giving yourself some kind of reward for it mm. and, and the number in there was a little bit daunting for me I saw 66 days you need to, to create a bit of a habit and I thought gosh that feels a little bit overwhelming tell me the origin of that yeah, so I think um, this is sort of something that we that we say is that some of the research says that that might be how long it takes to, to form a habit. But actually, everybody's different. Actually, everybody has different experiences. Uh, we know that we need to do it um, you know, often to get it into our muscle memory, to get it into our, you know, the psychology of how we approach the day. Um, but it will be 
you know dependent on what it is on how challenging it is for you and and who you are as a as a person so um you know i think a lot of a lot of the skills that we talk about keep doing it as often as you can um but there's not necessarily a a, a set time i'd say very good very good um i love the idea of of being more habitual with something that matters and moving to action uh, of building the the habit and being intentional about that perhaps just as much as people are meticulous about goals and what's my distal goal what's the what's the proximal goal and and thinking about micro goals and and so on but thinking about how do i move to action how do i develop that healthy habit what am i going to do and choose my response if um, i meet some friction um, or if i don't hit my uh, targets and i love that idea of of starting to sort of develop more routine and habit so that it comes just a little bit easier it doesn't have to feel too effortful in our pursuits just just small steps um yeah. you know, and i think you know like this uh, with, with your mind with psychology it can be daunting you know how on earth do i get to a place where you know where i want to be and actually it's just these these small small things and the other thing i like about um the idea of habits is how it links to our identity um and you know going back to values if you recognize that one of your values um you know is let's let's take courage can I develop habits that enable me to live by that, to take little bits of courage each week, each month, whatever it is. So I think there's a really nice link there between what we value, what's important in our life um, and how we can link our, our behaviors, our actions, which we know we can control and have you know influence over. How do we link those with, with the person that we want to be? I love though what you said, Steve, that recognizing also that even in building the habits and making them small steps and all those good things, our mind is still going to get in the way. We're still going to have uncomfortable feelings, have thoughts that we don't want to have. We're still going to struggle with them, still going to want to get pushed them away. So it's about preempting that as well of going, OK, even this is this is the habit I want to do. Oh, what might my mind say to me? Oh, what might my body be experiencing? OK, how what have I got in my kit bag now to help me when I spot that? When I'm mindful, I can spot that. What am I going to do to overcome that? So it, it, that's what I love about I, I, we both love that about ACT is all the processes work together. It's not like A plus B plus C plus D. They, they just all come and go. And, and in one moment, you'll pull one out of your kit bag and go, oh, I need to use this the next minute it's mindful next minute it's committed action you know it's doing what matters and, and so on so they kind of all move around i'm wafting my arms around here you can't see me but yes they all move around and you use all of them all of the time and and that sort of leads me to the, a, a, a final question really around just what do you hope is the legacy of the book good question <laughs> i suppose it links with with the goal of the book i hope that people read it and realize that they don't have to keep struggling i hope that that people read it and they can learn for themselves or they share it with somebody else that there's a different way of approaching life and of sport and actually um we can we can enjoy it more and we can perform better all in the same breath by just thinking slightly differently or using you know some of the tools from this book so I'd love, you know, I think the thought of people reading it and it and it changing the way that they think about themselves and it changing the way they think about the sport. I'd love that to to have a positive influence over people. And I I think um, I I'd love it if the book enabled people who might leave sport because they couldn't handle the thoughts and feelings to stay in sport. And also with we said this right at the very beginning of there being a more healthy way for people to engage in sport to you you said it very clearly Steve you know you you've met these Olympians and realized that they were human beings after all they, they have the same thoughts and feelings that we all have and for if only the book opens that up for people people go oh do you know what I'm really quite normal whether I'm you know on the Olympic track or I'm just starting out in my sport I'm, I'm quite normal this is normal stuff and here's a way now for me to not be burnt out, to not be traumatized, to not lead the sport, to not feel like I'm a failure. 
to recognize that they're just normal things that people have and here's a set of ways of, of moving forwards towards what I want to do in, in my sport that would be amazing mm -hmm. to quote um Craig Revel Hallwood amazing <laughs> okay well I'm going to give it a more than a seven but I think that there's a the dropping the struggle you could you could probably read the title drop the struggle and to a certain extent you understand the, the premise of the book very quickly but what this seems to me is that this this is a campaign for a skill set to enable you to do that and to be more mindful be more healthier be, be more forward focused about creating your life um it's a bit like meeting those olympians that they were coping with it and you can either look at it and think ah they were born with that skill or they've learned it from themselves or they've learned it from each other or that they have developed it naturally um so well thank you for showcasing act um thank you for the conversation i've really enjoyed looking through the book and um I really thought it was kind and accessible, practical and, and actually inspiring in many in many places. So thanks so much for the conversation today. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you.